on the other side of the screen. It all looks so easy. It's a computer programming language. All right, teach it to me. You can't, not unless you know basic. Hi there, my friend, and welcome to the next episode of Mr. Fred's Tech Talks. This is the official podcast of GetMeCoding.com, where I make learning to code, explore technology, and build confidence fun and approachable for kids, parents, and teachers. I'm Mr. Fred, husband and father, college professor, former Marine officer, and a lifelong tech tinkerer. I'm also the guide through this world of tech for you. So today, we're going to answer a question I get all the time. I really do get this all the time, by the way. Mr. Fred, what is coding? Really? All right, so spoiler alert. It's not just for those hoodie wearing Silicon Valley types. So let's go. Talking about gadgets, games, and gears. AI buzzing in your ears. Parents, teachers, kids unite. We're learning tech and doing it right. Oh, it's a tap swipe scroll kind of show where zeros and ones are ready to go. From old school DOS to robots to talk, we're jamming with Mr. Fred's Tech Talks. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty, I wanna strip away the mystery. Coding, also known as computer programming, is simply giving instructions to a computer so it could do something for you. And that's something could be a lot of different things. It could be a video game. It could be a weather app. The controls for a Mars rover, or even the program that's delivering this podcast right now to you through your phone or your device, or maybe even your car. All right, so in my blog post, what is coding? It's over at getmecoding.com. I break it down like this. Think of coding like writing a recipe. You all know what a recipe is, right? So it's for something you would eat. You tell the computer step-by-step step what ingredients to use and what order to mix them. Computers don't guess though. They do follow your instructions exactly. And that's why clarity matters. All right, before we really do go further into this topic, and I'm gonna talk about this from a little bit of a history perspective. I wanna talk about math, and I could hear the collective groan right now. So math is this type of subject that really challenges people. And sometimes we all get aggravated by it. And a lot of times I'll hear, I don't wanna study math. I'm never really gonna use this. And they're not all wrong, but what is math really doing for us in terms of thinking logically. Now, when I was choosing to study computer science, I began to look at what kind of courses I was going to take. And I realized I'm going to be taking a lot of math courses. Math. Wait, what does math have to do with computer science, computer programming? Well, math trains the brain. When you're going through school from kindergarten all the way up to graduating in your senior year in the United States, 12th grade, you're taking math. And all the while, you're building, but math is shaping your brain. The best way I could maybe make this relatable to most of the people listening to this is this idea of New Year's resolutions. We all know what that means. So that when the New Year starts off, everybody makes these great promises to do something different with themselves. A lot of times people will say, I wanna get in shape and to get in shape, they're gonna to go to the gym. For some people, going to the gym is a chore. It's, it's uh, a lot of work, it's a big commitment. And they'll go to the gym, hoping to get in better shape, because that's their New Year's resolution. And then they'll go for three weeks, and they'll look, look at themselves in the mirror, and they'll say, I don't see any changes. And then they kind of quit, because it's hard, it takes time. But if you stick with it and you do it for, many weeks and then ultimately months and eventually over the course of a year, you're going to see some definite changes in how your body looks. Your muscles will get stronger and you know, you might be getting more physically fit. Okay. So what does math have to do with that? Well, math has the same effect over time. All you're doing is going through steps to solve a problem. Once you get the basics of math, adding, subtracting, multiplication, division, it starts to build. And then when you move towards the more uh, complex, we'll say complex maths, like calculus, you're training your brain to think logically. Thinking logically is really at the core of creating software. You have to create the steps 
that you're going to tell the computer to do. So that's really important. So now next time when you're in math class and if you really like technology, there's a little bit of motivation to kind of stick it out. Just like when you go to the gym or you go on a run or you go swim or whatever you're doing to train yourself. Think of math as training for your brain and maybe that'll make it a little bit easier for you to follow. All right. Now, in a lot of the classes that I teach, I always put things into context and that simply means I like to give students a little bit of a historical background. So I'm going to give that to you right now and let's go back in time. If we go way back in time to, we'll say a thousand years ago, there's marketplaces and in these marketplaces, people would be selling their goods. People would go there and they would do an exchange, right? They would give some coins, money, and they would buy something from the vendor, the person that was there in the market selling something. So let's say there's a blanket salesman there. And the blanket salesman, like a lot of people today, wasn't really strong with doing math. Well, in order to do these transactions quickly and efficiently, they needed to have something that allowed them to do that. So the abacus was created. Abacus, abacus, however you want to say it. And you can see a picture of this over at the getmecoding.com blog, and I have a picture. But if you're not sure what it is, it looks like this string of beads, and there would be maybe rows of them, depending upon how complex the abacus was. And then the person selling the, the blanket would move the beads to the left and the right, and then they would count them. And this would help them do the transaction faster and more accurately. So that's really an important first step right there in understanding technology has always allowed us to do things faster and more accurately for the most part. Now moving forward into the 1800s, businesses start to grow and flourish and more activity starts to take place. So they create the calculator. The calculator was a mechanical device at that time that allowed someone to do addition and subtraction quickly, but now also multiplication and division. All right, before we go any further though, I do wanna give a special nod to who is considered the father of modern day computing, and that's Charles Babbage. So we're going right around the early 1800s. Charles Babbage was trying to also improve the idea of better math calculations and so on. So he created something known as the difference engine. And if you saw a picture of it, it, it doesn't look like anything like a computer does today, but it's that early step of manipulating bits. And he really laid that foundation. Another interesting part of that story or that bit of history is his relationship with someone whose name was Ada Lovelace. So let me just tell you a little bit. And if you're interested in this portion of the story, I want to let you know that I reviewed a children's book called Ada Lovelace, and I have that available on the Get Me Coding YouTube channel and also in a blog post. So who is Ada Lovelace? All right, once again, we're thinking the 1800s. At this point in time, women were not typically supported or directed to go into the hard sciences. It was really, a, a, all the sciences were really reserved for men at the time. Now, Ada Lovelace was the daughter of some well-to-dos, and like a lot of the well-to-dos back in that time frame, they would have parties. Charles Babbage ended up going to a party at Ada Lovelace's house. Now, she was a younger woman then, and she had heard about Charles Babbage and his work. Now, she loved doing math. She loved logic. And so she approached Charles Babbage, and before you know it, they struck up a conversation. And in that conversation, she shared with him her work on creating an algorithm that would be used in early computing. And that little bit of unknown history sometimes gets glossed over because, once again, Charles Babbage was really at the forefront of the development of this device. But Ada Lovelace is somewhat considered the creator of modern day programming. Now, if you want to learn more about what she was like and so on, like I said, check out the children's book that I did review. It's a really good story and it's a great one to incorporate into your classroom or your own, uh, your own personal library. We're now using electricity to automate that process further. And that's where the first computers were then created. They've always been by our side helping us do things faster. And then for the, these examples, they were all really based um, or supporting commerce which is the buying and selling of goods. So now we have the electric computer. 
Now you know, electricity can be either turned on or off. Now for the next part of my discussion here, I am not, I'm going to base it all on electricity and what's known as the bit or the binary digit. That's a zero or a one. Zero meaning the power is off, one meaning the power is on. So by turning something on or off, we can control the computer. Going forward, there is another computer that is being developed quite rapidly, and that's known as the quantum computer. And we're not going to talk about that because, boy, that's a tough one to really explain. But with the traditional computer that we have today, everything you have, even your phone, your, your uh, game system, your Xbox, your PlayStation, all of these are a form of a computing device, and they're controlled by turning things on and off. Inside the computer itself, the, the turning of uh, the power on and off really gets down to logic. And for those of you that will study computer science, you'll get into understanding how do you control it at that level. That's the machine level where you do that. So the bit and controlling the bit, well, that's where computer science comes back into play. Programmers would control or write code that would basically turn on the zeros and the ones. Now, that's a real tedious way to write a computer program, and it takes a lot of time. So to improve upon that, they started to create programming languages. So at this point, I think it's only fair and quite proper to introduce Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper, in the early 1930s and heading into the 1940s, was making this realization that computer languages needed to be created. She really did feel that people wanted to use regular English instead of doing all these code manipulations. So she's given credit with some early development of some languages, but what really is her, I guess, claim to fame in one regards, besides many of other things, it's creating the COBOL programming language. COBOL stands for Common Business Oriented Language, and it was really furthering her notion that, you know, programming languages or code languages should be written in a language that was close to English rather than in what we call machine code. So she kept on taking the industry in that direction. Just like we speak different languages in the world, there are different computer languages. Now, these computer languages are known as high-level programming languages. Some examples would be C, C++, Java, even JavaScript. These are all programming languages that a human could create or use to create a software program. So once again, at the lowest level, we have the bit or assembler or assembly language, and that would be manipulating the zeros and the ones. That's low level language. Then we go to the high level languages. The only thing I'll say is that if you program the computer at the machine level, you are at the lowest level and you're controlling everything. High level languages, they tend to add a layer of complexity. And that's why we study how to write software because it's complex. Once again, we write the software to control the hardware. Now I'm not gonna go into the details of what is computer hardware today, but think of your, inside of your computer, you have a storage device, a hard drive, you have memory, and then you have the display, sound. Well, those are hardware components and software is created to control the hardware. All right, so how about you? You might not realize it, but coding touches almost every part of your day from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Think about it, like your alarm clock, that's coded. Your car's navigation system is coded. Your favorite social media app, it's coded, right? So it's all around us. And that's why software is, is still really important to learn. One of the reasons why I love teaching this is because kids and parents and even grandparents can get involved. I've seen eight-year-olds building cool games using block-based coding tools like Scratch. And I'll talk about that in a second. And I've seen retirees begin to learn a programming language known as Python just to automate their hobbies and their projects. So it is all around us. It's become what's called democratized. Now that's a really cool world. 
So for those of you getting ready to go back into the classroom this fall, take that word to your teacher, democratization. No, it doesn't really have anything to do with voting and expressing your opinions. Democratization is making something accessible to everyone. Software has become widespread. It's used all around us, right? Like I just said. But we've made the tools now easier to use to create software. Like I had said, maybe some of you have already used the software tool called Scratch created by MIT. If you go over to the courses at gimmecoding.com, you'll see that I have a lot of tutorials on how to use Scratch because it's that type of tool that'll get you started learning to code. All the blocks that are there, so it's known as low code programming. Low code programming simply means that you don't have to learn all the actual syntax, as they say, the words, the phrases to write your software program. You could simply stack blocks. They're different colored blocks that represent certain tasks. Like if you want something to be done repetitively, that's known as a loop. Well, the loop is represented by a specific color and shape of a block. You snap the blocks together and before you know it, you have a game. And that simple approach makes it easier for other people to do. And that's the democratization that I'm talking about. For those of us that have been around, have been around for a long time, and we learned programming by writing lines of code, you sat down and you had to type it and you had to know the syntax. That's what you studied in the classrooms. It's advancing rapidly right now. And I'm going to get into that in part two of our talk, but it's advancing rapidly where we have really great tools now that'll help us either auto complete it or even write some of it for us. But at the core of it all is always understanding what it is you're trying to build, what problem you're trying to solve, maybe what game you're trying to make. So there are a lot of languages out there. Some of them are more complicated than others. But the big thing that you could do is you could start like right now. Anybody at any age can start writing code. All right, so it's time for this episode's tech tip. If you're curious about coding, but don't know where to start, I'd encourage you to check out Microsoft's Make Code Arcade. It's free, it's fun, it lets you build simple games right in your browser. When I say it runs right in your browser, that means that you don't have to do any software installation on your computing device. So it makes it real easy to use. And when you're building with Microsoft Make Code Arcade, you can see the results instantaneously. I'm also going to say you check out Scratch, Scratch created by MIT. I'll put a link to both of these websites in the show notes. All right, so now you know what coding is, and simply put again, it's giving clear instructions to a computer. But here's the bigger question. Why should you learn it? Now, that's going to be something I go into in the next episode. That's where we're going to dive into some other aspects of what's going on with the field of software programming. I'll share some stories about how coding isn't just about getting a tech job, but it's more about problem solving and being creative and building skills you can use in everyday life. But until then, I challenge you to try writing a few lines of code. Even if it's just moving a cartoon character across a screen, you're going to be surprised at how empowering it feels. That's it for this first part of this two-part episode. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, go check out my full post, What is Coding, over on the getmecoding.com website. And I also give you some more examples and some of their resources you could explore. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss the next episode. Why learn to code? Coming soon. All right, until then, keep tinkering, keep exploring, and remember, technology is a tool. It's what you do with it that counts. See you next time. Don't have a good day, have a great day.